Hello, my name is Pier van der Westeisen, director of the Gilmore, and I'm joined today again by Zaid Pixley, um, a good friend, a wonderful board member of the Gilmore and esteemed musicologist, uh, to talk about the film Bronfman and the concert we are going to hear. Zaid, welcome. I'm so glad to see you again. I'm glad to be here, Pierre. It's going to be a wonderful program. I'm so happy to be part of the Gilmore. So okay. can you tell us a little bit about what Bronfman is going to be playing? Absolutely. Well, he is presenting two of Beethoven's sonatas, uh, an early one, the Opus 10, number three, and also Opus 57, uh, otherwise known as Appassionata. Um, and these two works couldn't be more different. I think of it as an opera with two different acts. Uh, but the same character evolving uh, in that opera. And then we have the Debussy, the sweet uh, Bergamasque, uh, which in my mind acts as sort of an, an intermission, you know, something completely different. Um, and I, I just love how Bronfen conceived of that program and, and put it together. Um, you know, but as we're talking, I'd like to ask you, um, speaking of Opus 10, number three, early Beethoven Sonata, can you tell us about Beethoven and the time in this, when this was composed? This was a great time for Beethoven. He, it was 1798, been living in Vienna since 1792. Things were going really, really well. His music was selling well. He had many, many opportunities to play in concerts and piano concertos and he was a really wonderful pianist. And to support him, many of the patrons, the nobles and aristocrats in Vienna gave him stipends so that he could work and compose. And they often had private concerts starring Beethoven and their other house musicians in their stately homes, invited their friends, and they were very sophisticated audience. They were very receptive to new music and to Beethoven's music. So he was able to write what he wanted to write and to experiment. And we can really see that as his sonatas go on. This particular sonata, Opus 10, number three, is dedicated to one of his patrons, a countess, Anna Margareta von Braun, and she and her husband were very big supporters of Beethoven. So this is his present to her. So I'm very wondering, cool. Pierre, it's such a great piece of music and such a good program. Thank you for putting it together. Can you tell us a little bit about this Opus 10, number three? <laughs> Ah, uh, yes. I mean, this is a wonderful, bubbly, bright, joyful piece of music. Um, and you can tell that he was very clearly influ influenced by his two teachers, Haydn and Mozart. Um, the first and the last movements particularly are what we consider motivic, monothematic, uh, meaning one theme. Um, and he takes tiny little blocks of that theme and you hear it in different variations all over the place. Um, so in that regard, it's very Haydn-esque. There's humor all over the place. Haydn was known for his humor. It's very extroverted um, and it's kind of a joyful D major. Um, and then you have the second movement, which is D minor, and it's probably the most tragic piece written to date at that point. Um, and very Mozartian, um, it harkens back to his uh, D minor fantasy. Uh, I think of the opera Don Giovanni and also his D minor concerto, which uh, Beethoven would have played. Um, it also has four movements, um, which a lot of the classical sonatas as, and the symphonies actually had four movements. Uh, so he builds from there, takes from there and adds the minuet movement, the dance movement. Later on, these uh, movements become really fast, it becomes scherzos, that's really not danceable, um, but uh, you can see them prevalent in this in these early works. Um, so, you know, the Appassionata is then on the other end of the spectrum. It was composed seven years later. Um, and I'm curious if you can explain to us a little bit what happened in Beethoven's life in the, mean, in the interim. Well, what you're saying about the slow movement of Opus 10 and the sadness and tragedy is kind of prefigures what is happening. Because already at that time in 1797 and 98, Beethoven was hearing, was having trouble hearing and had ringing and buzzing in his ears, which got progressively worse. So he went to a number of doctors who tried various ineffectual treatments. And then five years later in 182, Beethoven realized and the doctors told him that this was a permanent progressive condition. 
And in the meantime, he had stopped going out, even though he had been a real social musician, because he said, I find it impossible to say to someone, I can't hear you. And yeah. we know about this, about how Beethoven felt, because he wrote about it in letters to friends and also in a very important document that he left in a secret drawer to be opened after his death called the Heiligenstadt Testament, which he wrote really to all of us, but ostensibly to his brothers, said, my hearing, of all the things I possess, my hearing is the most precious to me. And he was it was so devastating to him that he considered suicide. Mm. But he wrote, I have still so much to say, I have so much to do that I'm, I will try over this and I will devote my life to my art. And that's what he did, writing one wonderful piece after another. So the chronology here, 1797, the deafness begins, 1802, the Heiligenstadt Testament, and this is 1804, the Appassionata Sonata. So Pierre, can you tell us about how Beethoven's, this sonata expresses what is happening to him? Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of amazing. Um, we, you know, that's a familiar story to most of us now who know Beethoven, the fact that he uh, became deaf, um, but I'm, I still try to imagine myself as a working musician and composer in his shoes. Um, so it's really hard and, and it can be risky to, you know, read a composer's life into his art. You know, if you think of Mozart, he experienced plenty of tragedy um, and heartache, but you wouldn't necessarily tell it in his music. Uh, but with, with Beethoven, you know, there's pre-diagnosis and post-diagnosis. And you definitely can see in the sonatas, the Opus C number three and the Opus 57, the Appassionata, two completely different people. Um, you know, this, it's in a way, these sonatas are a microcosm of Beethoven's life. Uh, first, a bubbly young man full of life, and then the tragedy strikes. And then if I look further in the late sonatas, uh, Opus 110, Opus 111, it's as if, you know, he found peace and he made peace with this. And um, in a way, we're, as, as a human race, sort of thankful for what happened to him because he heard things that would not have been possible otherwise. I mean, he conceived of sounds um, coming out of the instrument that I don't think would have been possible without this happening to him. So, um, but, you know, the sonata, the appassionata is tragic all the way through. Um, it is an astonishing work. Um, it has incredible architecture and uh, power uh, to make for a perfect combination. And um, Carl Cherney, one of his students, actually said he, he thought of this as his favorite sonata. Um, so the first movement starts with, astonishingly, very simple, just a minor chord, a minor triad, um, you know, downwards, descending. And I've often thought, how is it possible that a simple arpeggiated chord can sound so epic? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's, it's the way you present it. It's the, the texture, uh, there are two octaves apart. It's this, the, the dynamics, uh, pianissimo, the rhythm. It has sort of a nervous energy to it. So it's searching, it's questioning. And then you have this fate motif um, at the lower end of the of the keyboard, bum, 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 which comes from the Fifth Symphony uh, the, that we know so well as that fate knocking at the door. And that motif comes uh, back all throughout the first movement. There's a huge range of dynamics. He uses the full range of the piano, the extreme registers. Um, and it's interesting to, to also just note that I think the way that Beethoven pushed the boundaries of the piano really inspired piano builders around that time also to, to expand the piano, expand the range and what the piano is possible of do, doing. Um, and we see this all throughout music history where how composers conceive of sound also influences the instruments that are built around that. Um, and then this slow movement, um, it's kind of short and it provides some respite um, some rest, some peace, but it's not joyful. You know, it's sort of like, I think of it as you're taking a breath in between sobs almost. Um, and it doesn't end, you know, it, it sort of uh, ends up in the air and immediately follows into the last movement. Um, and the last movement is just this 
cascade, this waves of sound, it just keeps coming, coming, it's relentless. Uh, you're, you're almost out of breath just listening to it. Um, and he wrote in big letters, you know, the second part must be repeated in his manuscript. And you're thinking, I think as a pianist, you're thinking, you've got to be kidding me. Um, and then just when you think that the pianist can't give any more, he asks, now go faster, you know, accel accelerate and go prestissimo. Um, so it really is a, a monument uh, uh, effort and um, just extremely exciting to see. So then we contrast these two works with the suite Bergamasque by Debussy, which is, again, just from a completely different world. And I'd love to know from a musicologist standpoint, your thoughts on the Debussy and, and the suite Bergamasque. Yes, it is a completely different world. And it's such an interesting program that Bronfman has put together to, to juxtapose this work with the two Beethoven sonatas. Uh, Beethoven, as you're saying, was such a masterful architect with so much power, such a brilliant composer, so ingenious that composers after him, and he died in 1827, were kind of, didn't know really what to do. Should they keep trying to do that and do it better? Should they do something else? And Debussy was clearly in the, I'm doing something else frame of mind. And he was French. This piece, Sweet Bargamasque, is written in Paris in 1890 to 91. It's an illustrious musical tradition, and as we know, a painting tradition. So if you think of Monet's haystacks, those paintings of haystacks, but mm -hmm. at different times of year, different times of day, and so you see the same thing, but in different guises. That's exactly what Debussy said he was about. He said, my music is research into the many sounds that I can get from a single note. So he makes very clear that he was also tremendously interested in poetry and the symbolist poets were writing at that time. One called Paul Verlaine had written a suite Bergamasque in Fête Galant, his collection of dances and piano pieces. The very first one in that set is named Claire de Lune. So Debussy loved that piece, that poem, set it as a song twice and then set it as a piano piece. The words of course are gone but the atmosphere is intensified. And he also, to for a form, he didn't write a sonata, he wrote suites. And he looked back to the suites of Bach, which are stylized dances and other movements. And he took three of the movements from Bach, the prelude, a duet, and a passepied. And he added a kind of movement from Couperin, the great, the great French Baroque composer of harpsichord suites. Cooper wrote many vivid musical portraits, so Debussy puts in his suite a musical portrait in the style of Cooper, Claire de Lune. And of course, it's one of the most, most played pieces ever. So Pierre, you're a pianist. Can you tell us about what it's like, first of all, to play Beethoven? What is that like? What are the challenges? Then to play Debussy, and then it would be interesting to play them on the same program. Yeah. Um, you know, this, yeah, what a program. So, you know, with Beethoven, not only does it require um, great polish, great accuracy, uh, great virtuosity, and you have to have co complete control over articulation and um, sound control, uh, you know, and, and on top of that, then, uh, it demands so much more. It has an emotional component. Uh, it, it demands total commitment from the pianist, otherwise it's not convincing. Um, you know, Beethoven completely embraced the human experience and that's why we think of him as still relevant today. Uh, he speaks so clearly to us and he, he himself said, you know, from the heart to the heart. Um, and I think that's why it also suits uh, Yefim Bronfman so well, you know, especially in the, the Appassionata, but Opus number three as well. I mean, it's fiery, it's virtuosic, it's powerful uh, in technique and, and big emotional sweeping gestures. And these are all things that I connect with uh, Yefim Bronfman. Uh, the very first time I heard him, there's this beautiful, deep sound and, and just um, that can carry in a hall of 3000. Uh, and, and so I think, you know, it's kind of the perfect combination between Bronfman and, and Beethoven. Uh, but then you have Debussy. And as you said, you know, um, 
KBC is focused on color and the development of a single tone, the color of a single tone. So as a pianist, you have to spend a lot of time practicing exploring different colors of a single tone, whether you play it with the, the flat of your finger or the tip of your finger, um, where it, how you approach the note, whether it's a fast approach or a slower approach. Um, and the, all of these things have to be guided by your ear. You can only explore those colors with your ear. And then there's also the chord structure, you know, unlike in Beethoven, where the, the the these chords mean something in Beethoven. They have a clear direction of where they need to go. They need to go home. <laughs> um, whereas in Beethoven and in Debussy, um, the, the the chords basically serve the function just of coloring the tone. They're a color palette, and so you have to spend a lot of time um, voicing the chords, vo finding a different voice that you maybe want to highlight in there, um, and 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 just exploring how that uh, that chord can um, create color for a specific tone. So it's, a, it's just a completely different approach uh, in these two composers. And uh, I love that. You know, and then I'm so happy uh, that uh, Claire de Lune is part of this Sweet Bergamas. We've talked about it a bit, a bit now, but, you know, it's one of those pieces, probably the most famous piece written for piano and I've sat on so many competition juries and heard piano exams um, of many young uh, young pianists uh, who think that this is quite easy and that they can play this. But um, you know, hearing a master like Yefim Bronfman play this, uh, you it, all of a sudden a whole world opens because you know often. Uh, the young pianist can be too emotional when they play this. They become too involved. They're, you know, you, and you have to be divorced from it a little bit. Your pacing is very different. The voicing of the chords, the voicing of the tones themselves. Uh, so it'll be just a completely different experience hearing it uh, in his hands. So I'm it's excited cool. about that. It's going to be wonderful. So can you tell us again when he will be playing and how we can hear him play and also what else the virtual Gilmore has in store for us? Yes, so he is playing uh, from Steinway Hall, New York City, uh, where he uh, is playing from. And this will be streaming on December 6th at 2 p.m. So we, we hope you all can uh, tune in. You go to uh, thegilmore.org uh, for ticket information. It's a pay what you can basis. So we hope you all uh, can join us and support us in that. And then coming up, uh, we have a few more Beethoven sonatas. Uh, in March, we have the rising star Evren Ozell with Beethoven's Opus 109. And then in May, Avery Gagliano with uh, Opus 27, number one, I believe. And then we also have Angela Hewitt coming up with an all Bach program. So we hope to see everybody there. And as they, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, as always, I love chatting with you and here's to many more. Yes, thank you so much, Pierre.